So yeah, so, so we'll start out, you know, it, it's a natural process composting. This is something that occurs in nature. And I think that's really important for us to remember. What we're trying to do is, you know, like we always do is isolate things and make them cleaner and neater and faster. <clears throat> it's just the human nature. <clears throat> so we're going to take food scraps. We're going to break them down by a variety of factors microorganisms, temperature, moisture, different things that are kind of working together to transform these things. The purpose of compost is to make plants grow. And there was a time in history um, back in the 1800s where this guy, Justus von Liebig, has anyone heard this name before? He was a German uh, chemist. He's the guy that came up with NPK. If you go to buy fertilizer, you're going to get NPK fertilizer, right? It's going to say, and it's going to have numbers by it. What's the, what's the balance? Interesting thing about Liebig, and I like to bring books if I'm doing something at a library, right? It makes a lot of sense. This is Organic Chemistry and Its Applications to Agriculture and uh, Physiology. A little light reading, you know? Um, the interesting thing about him is that, so... Reductionist science is that idea of really taking everything into its parts and saying, oh, if this equals this and this plus this, then it must, you know, but nature is synergistic, right? If you have five plus five, it equals 20 in nature because it's not, because it's actually more than just five plus five. It's thousands of interconnected things. Justice von Liebig realized this on his deathbed, actually. He created chemical agriculture. He created an industry. And he regretted it. And this is what he said. April 18th, 1873. I sinned against the wisdom of the creator and have received my righteous punishment. I wish to improve the, his work. And in my blindness, believe that in the marvelous chain of laws, binding life on earth's surface and keeping it always knew a link had been forgotten. Which I weak, powerless worm must supply. Now, I do not go around bashing <clears throat> what different people do to farm, to this, to that. But we have to realize the motivation in our society is industry and money. Nature can, has, and always will do it better. It might not do it faster. It might not do it to our specific whims all the time. But what we're going to do today is just assist nature, right? We're not going to pull it into little parts and say, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium. We're going to assist it and we're going to help it to create something good that we can use in our gardens or farms. Sorry, I didn't mean to get deep so fast there for you guys. <coughs> Should have saved that for the end, right? Let's talk, let's talk more about the benefits of composting. Sorry. Um, so the first thing is we're going to reduce waste to landfills. We're going, to reduce, we're going to reduce greenhouse gases. I can get into some details about that. I'm not a scientist, but, you know, basically you're having these things done under the ground, inside. It's trapping this carbon in here rather than the release. Tillage of earth releases carbon dioxide. Um, keeping it flat, layering things reduces it. Um, it's going to help plants grow. And it's going to save you some money because you're not going to have to buy that fertilizer. Basics of composting is choosing a location, adding the organic materials to it. Um, you want to balance the carbon and nitrogen in it. All these things we're going to discuss. Uh, you want to maintain the proper moisture levels, and then you want to maintain the airflow, um, the proper airflow. So, yeah, where is it going to go? How are we going to construct it? And what are we going to put in it? Um, so every, I like to think of it as elements, and I'll just cruise through here. So you have earth, water, air, and fire. You can see these things superimposed over each other all the time, right? So the earth element is the ingredients of the compost pile. The water is, of course, water, rain, moisture within. Um, the air is something, the important aspect of the air, and we'll go into a little more detail about this, is the idea of anaerobic versus aerobic bacteria. And so this is a problem in 
the moving of materials, waste, manure, farming, um, and, and that kind of uh, one of the main things that contributes to is odor, but it also affects the way that it is transformed. And then, of course, the temperature. And so a couple of things about temperature um, at a high level is that compost can get so hot it can catch on fire. Also, you want it to get hot because it's going to kill your thistle seeds. <laughs> okay. So, again, balance. And, and, you know, I don't like to just, like, freak everyone out. I mean, rare, rarely does a compost but, uh, a compost uh, pit catch on fire, right? It's not, not a very common thing. But we do want to kind of monitor that and figure out what's going on. Um, so choosing a location for your compost pile. Some of the things we want to think about is convenience, convenient for you to access, that it is like well drained. You don't want something that's like in a low level of your yard where water is just going to collect. <clears throat> so even on a little incline or a hillside, that might be nice. Um, you want it to be protected from extreme temperatures. So you really don't want it out in the middle of a field because it's going to get that sun all day. So in the middle of a drought, you're, you are going to have that potential danger and it's not necessarily going to transform so well. And then you basically want it out of out of sight and out of smell for the neighbors. There will be smells no matter what, you know. Um, obviously, if you live in an HOA, this may be more of an issue and something that you have to look at your paperwork, you know. Um, if you live out in the country, it may be no issue whatsoever. So, but it's just something that you have to consider for yourself. Um, so where will your compost pile go? So this, these are a couple of things that I put together that I thought might be might be some considerations for where to put your co your compost pile, proximity to your kitchen, right? You have your scraps. How do those get from point A to point B? Your garden. That's you can harvest things from your garden and take what you don't eat, put it right there. Visibility from the road or yard, watershed airflow, and fire safety, right? You also don't want it yeah, in, a, in a place where there are there is dry things that could catch or or whatnot. Again. I'm going to downplay that a little bit. It's not, not a huge deal. It doesn't happen often, just something to consider. Compost pile construction. So uh, at least one of you mentioned that you had a composting device, right? And it looks something like this. I have some opinions on, on some of these things I'll share with you, but I also like, I'm like, sure, if it works for you. You know, sometimes like things don't work for, work for some people and don't work for others. I think compost needs to have ground contact. I really do. I think it on a scientific level. I also think it on a spiritual level. I think we know the microorganisms that are going to affect and are going to transform our compost. Where do they live? They live in the ground. What happens when you till soil? What happens when you move these things around constantly? They can't take hold. And some of these organisms that we're talking about, uh, fungi, mycelium. Um, ants even, right? Centipedes, um, black soldier fly, fly larva, all, all these kinds of things are actually working in your compost pile and I think they're important. It's a matter of balance. You know, obviously don't want it to be completely filled with ants. If it's completely filled with ants, well you're throwing a lot of things with sugar in the compost. That's what they're looking for. Uh, or maybe your compost is just completely ready and should have been dispersed somewhere, but it's the perfect place for ants to live now, right? You just made, you just made the Taj, or not the Taj Mahal, you made a fantastic <laughs> hotel for them. Um, this thing on the right, I'm starting to see these things more often. I, I don't think this is a compost creator. I think this is a dirt creator. Um, and there is a difference between soil and dirt. So this is a little appliance that sits on your counter and sure it speeds things up and it adds heat and it makes sure the moisture and the heat is right. It's obviously on a very small scale, but I think it's a shiny thing that to sell is what it is. And I don't necessarily think, I think at that volume too, you're not making a huge impact on the landfill either. Um, some of them say they'll do it in a couple of days. Some of them say they'll do it overnight. Um, so maybe you can process things through, but I just don't, I, again, I don't think it's compost. So the rotator moves things around. It doesn't have any ground contact. Um, but some people have had success with it, you know, and for some people it's more ergonomic. You can stand upright and put, it's kind of like at level for you. So, you know, it's an option. Um, this is what I really like. And while that's a terrible picture, I apologize. Um, I had two of these, um, 
we just relocated. We were in Marietta, then we moved to Florida, and then we moved back. And while I was in Florida, they had this really cool composting program where they like gave these things away. Unfortunately, they are a little expensive to purchase, I think over $100, um, but they work really well and they last a long time. They are made of plastic, um, but they can actually be recycled and they may even be made from recycled materials. But to me, it kind of like checks all these boxes, you know? It's in contact with the ground, it's a good size. Um, and that's something I'll talk about when we talk about how you might be able to construct your own um, composting bin. But really, you kind of need, you need that density. That's the only way you get the heat and moisture and air that, that's in the right combination to kind of, to transform it. Um, you couldn't have a two, you couldn't have this bucket um, actually transform your uh, compost. The air vents allows for that, and it actually has these, um, and I'm not sponsored by Earth Machine, I don't <laughs> receive any money. Um, it has these corkscrew things that kind of go into the ground, so you, you dig a little trench, you can kind of get it right under the ground level where it's still kind of hard pan, and you can screw these corkscrew things in, and it's, it's right there. Nothing's going to, um, you know, dump it over, dig in it. Um, with the open top compost pits, which I'll, is actually what I want to show you how to make, you are going to have rodents, raccoons, possums, those kinds of things digging in it. I think that's part of it. <laughs> They're there anyway. You're not actually, you know, I, you're, I, don't, I don't think you, that you're creating an opossum um, population boom by having a compost pile. And they're digging in it a little bit and kind of messing around in it. So, so you can make your own. And um, this is the most absolute, simple, cheap, option to do it and obviously you have to have a little space either a nice size backyard or whatever um, but find kind of a semi shady spot that's located where it's convenient and works out for you um, get yourself a little roll of chicken wire and it should be three to four feet high but i guess maybe it would have to be about you know 10 feet long to get around and make about three or four feet right so you know it's kind of like <laughs> i'm just gonna make since we're all here in this room together, I couldn't do this on Zoom. I don't think it would work so well. You know, this is about how round you want it. About four feet in diameter, about four feet high. That is, I think you could read just about any book on composting and they say that makes a difference. So you make the chicken wire ring. You kind of stand it up floppily. And then um, you, well, well, you make it by taking this galvanized or, or stainless steel wire, and the reason it's galvanized or stainless steel, it's not going to like rust and fall apart in the first year. And you kind of thread it through, and you're kind of, if anybody, you know, sews or seams, it's just like putting two pieces of fabric together. And you're kind of sewing it through with the wire. And then you kind of pull out the edges with these stakes and tap them in, you know, all around. You don't actually have to do that, and that's why it says optional. Because as you fill it, it kind of starts to give its own structure. To do something at this scale, and this is why you might, you know, kind of go back to the earth machine, you know, or some of these things. To do something at this scale, it's going to take a long time to fill it up, you know. But you're going to be layering it with things. You're going to be asking your neighbors, hey, you guys can come and dump this stuff in here too. You're going to take your lawn clippings. You're going to take straw, whatever it is, right? Wood chips, all these kinds of things you can put into it. And we'll talk about that. So yeah, this is, this is an example of that. These are actually, um, this was a picture that I think was a promo for the, uh, that uh, Kirsten took here. These are just some pig panels that are kind of set up. I think maybe five of them pieces of pig panel in about a four foot diameter. And you know, it's filled just about to the top. It's kind of hard to see with the contrast because it was in winter and everything's brown, but <clears throat> The, the outside, as I, as I dump in the middle of it, and so you have this kind of mound of food coming up and other things and layers of things, I'm also filling around with pine needle straw, things on the side. And the only reason for that, I mean, look at these huge holes, right? With the chicken wire, it's not such a big deal. Almost anything could be held within that, but it's still nice to have a little sheath um, around the outside of it. And even in the earth machine, you know, it's kind of nice to kind of have that, something that's kind of a shell, kind of a skin for it. So then you have your, your compost bin built and you want to think about what kinds of things you're going to put into it. 
So it really is about balancing the carbon and the nitrogen. These are some carbon rich materials. The reason it's carbon and nitrogen is this, what the, this is what the microorganism, this creates the environment for the microorganisms to come in and do the alchemy and, and change things. So leaves, dry grass, straw, sawdust, paper. I've heard it referred to as brown and green, right? Like, I mean, paper could be any color, right? I say, I say low on the paper is a little tip just because every time you move it around and sift it, and get some compost out, you're gonna be like, you're gonna see the same paper you saw last time. You know, it just takes a while. But that being said, anything, grass, leaves, all, especially on this list, that you can get smaller, that makes a huge difference. Um, they make uh, leaf mulchers that are like electric. Um, I'm just putting whole things in. I just I haven't bought one of those, but I think about it every time because, again, I'm seeing the same. I'm like, I, I, I recognize this leaf, you know. It takes a while. It's a, it's, a, it's a sheet. It just takes a while to break down. But if you get that into, like, little pieces, you know, and I think this is a, you know, just, just for, like, visual aid, I actually, this is what I brought for the vermicomposting bin because um, it's free. It smells so nice. But what I did to break this down a little bit, and they're not whole leaves, is I ran over it with the lawnmower a whole bunch of times. It's just a little electric mower with a bag on it. I mean, you know, use what you have, start where you are, do what you can, right? Um, so that's an option. But if you had, like, you know, other things, if you had paper, you could get some of those shredding scissors or put it through a shredder. It would break down a lot faster. So you're layering carbon, and then you're layering nitrogen rich materials that's your fresh grass clippings your green brown and green right food scraps coffee grinds manure urine you know i'm just gonna say it i love going out and peeing on the compost pit i just know how how excellent yeah how excellent that is um and and just as a as a, a pro tip your urine first thing in the morning is better for the compost than later in the day. It has more urea in it. Um, other organic additives, fresh leaves, grass clipping, food scraps, coffee grinds, eggshells, put a little calcium in there, right? Soil's a multifaceted organism. Soil's an organism. And so having different elements um, in there, rock dust um, is another great one. What? That's a great question. Let me go to the next slide and I think we'll get there. Questionable materials. Okay. It doesn't say do not compost on here. In fact, you know, I was looking at lists and I was like, oh, this is a good list, but I'm going to change do not compost to questionable materials because you can compost anything. You can compost me. Um, in fact, the, uh, the Rodale Institute which literally wrote the book on composting, the complete book of composting, J.I. Rodale, right here in Pennsylvania. I went there for a field day and uh, they had kind of an open house and I got to speak to their composting guy. And he said, you see that pile over there? There's two pigs in it. So now that being said, if you have your little garden compost, you're not gonna wanna compost a pig in it. Um, and the reason for that is that you know, animals are made up of things that take longer to break down if they don't have the right conditions, if they don't have the, the mass. This pit that he was composting a pig, and the pig was sick and it had died, right? It wasn't just a project. <laughs> um, we, f we feel for the pig. Um, but, you know, it, it was huge. This was, you know, 10 feet in diameter, not just four. And a lot of things happened over that time, and I'm sure he let it go a long time. So. The reason I tell that story is not to absolutely disgust you, but rather to say, feel free, you know, to do things in moderation. Um, if you were to put, if you were to have a scoop of your dog's leavings and you put it in the bottom of a compost pile and didn't leave it for a long time and it got hot enough to kill bacteria and it didn't go anaerobic, it's no big deal, you know? Um, if you want to be super safe um, and you 
you know, when you're, you're definitely using this for vegetables, that's the other thing, right? Is like, what are you using it for? Are you using it for flowers? No big deal, you'll never eat it, right? It doesn't actually matter. Um, people are actually vermicomposting pet waste too. So that's an interesting thing about the worms that we'll talk about later. Um, you know, and, and I would add to this as well, the weeds. So you might harvest a bunch of weeds, um, and weeds is a funny word because what's a weed, right? But an, an undesired plant, something you do not want to plant all in your garden. You might, it's best to, if you're composting, you want to think about this stuff in the cycle. What's the life cycle of the plant? And so if you can harvest those before they go to seed, that's really great. If you harvest them when seed is on the plant, you could soak that plant in a big tub of water or all of that in a big tub of water, basically drown it um, and, the and then leave it on something to dry. If you do that cycle, chances are you're not going to get a ton of germination. So that's kind of a neat thing. It's a lot of extra work. The easier thing, if you have the foresight, is to think, what is the life cycle of that plant? Can I get it before it goes to seed? Which is basically before it goes to flower, ideally. Um, so I'll add that to that. Um, otherwise, you might want to take other measures to make sure that, that seed doesn't end up throughout. Now, that being said, we're talking about the temperature of the water, all this stuff in the compost pile, the heat that the compost pile is going to generate. Part of the reason that that is so great is it does tend to kill the seeds that are in it. Um, it also tends to germinate a lot of the seeds on the outside, which they can't grow again, right, if you turn them under. Farmers are doing um, green manure or cover crops <clears throat> where they basically plant an entire crop on something and then they will turn it under, right? It can't, again, it can't germinate again. Then they plant whatever else they want on it. The same could be true for the weeds. So turning the compost pile also might help that problem a little bit. Um, as well as just making sure that it gets up to heat. Um, moisture levels, uh, to me, I'm not really monitoring that a whole lot except with my hand. Um, so I might uh, dig a part out of it and see about how wet it is. Um, I think the most important thing is in the planning is knowing that it's not sitting in a pool of water, that it can kind of dry and moisten and get a little rain, but not too much. Uh, kind of thing. You don't want it to be like right on the edge of a gutter, just getting soaked all the time. It's not going to do what it needs to do. Um, that's kind of the main thing. And then airflow. Over time, your compost is it's going to start up here. You're going to build a pile like this. In fact, the pile that you saw the picture of me in front of um, until yesterday was like it was up here and I was down to here. So when it gets down like that, it's had so much time to decompose, but it's, everything is getting really close together. It was time for me to turn it. And I turned it into another pile, just a mound, and just covered it with something that's going to finish there. Um, you can also, uh, uh, this is part of the airflow monitoring, is the temperature. So this is a compost thermometer that I got on Amazon for maybe 20 bucks. Um, and they make them this big, they make them more industrial with big things so it doesn't, so this doesn't get tapped on. Um, but if uh, the temperature is too hot, the way that we solve that is that we, we aerate the compost. And if you're doing it in a big pit the, like the one I described, um, there are corkscrew type devices or you could just stick a big stick in it and kind of spin it around a little bit and you're basically making little chimneys around it. And that's if it gets up to a certain temperature. This particular, um, I'll kind of walk around a little bit. This particular thermometer has a green area. It says steady, active, and hot. And so the temperature ranges here are 80 degrees to 110 degrees for steady. So that's okay. Active is ideal, 110 to 130 degrees. But hot, that should be red, 130 on. That's hot. In fact, compost, um, another interesting thing you can do with compost if you're um, 
if you have a lot of free time on your hands and you want to save a little money is you could heat your water with your compost. So uh, all it is, is, is just, you could make a coil of copper inside of it. Copper is obviously a great heat uh, conduit. <clears throat> you can make a coil of copper inside it, put hose ends on both. You can have an outdoor shower that's hot, even in the winter. It's crazy, right? You can heat your house with it as well. But, you know, the only thing about that is that then at some point you have to move all of that and remove it and make new compost because it will only it will only bake and do do its stuff, you know, one time, basically. Let's see what else we got. OK, so the airflow and the moisture are two of the main factors in smells. And I love this quote from Joel Saladin. And this is actually a paraphrase because I couldn't find the actual quote. But when a farm smells, it's because it's sick. It's like a wound. If something is healthy, there will be no foul odors. It's unhealthy. There's, or there's one element of it that's unhealthy. And so that's something that we strive for is how can we maintain the balance? Is it too many animals? Is it that things have gone anaerobic um, in a manure pit or a compost pit or something else? Um, should smell actually kind of pleasant and earthy, your compost. So if there is something wrong with it, if, if you are getting a stench from the compost, I would recommend basically kind of taking it apart and putting it back together. Again, get the air back in. Probably want to add more carbon materials, more dry materials into it. You don't have to do it, you know, you don't have to bust it out over your whole yard. You might just be able to like, you know, take some of it out, put it in one bucket, and then just kind of rebuild it, relayer it. So compost doesn't have to stink is basically the point there. Um, and then using the compost is everybody's favorite part. Um, I will say that probably six to 12 months is what it actually takes to turn compost around and to create soil from everything else that you put into it. Um, so it does require a little bit of patience. Um, and like I said, in Florida, I had two of those earth machines, which was really great. The other thing about it is, um, you know, as you mentioned, it has a little door on the bottom of it, right? So you can kind of start with, you know, a couple feet of composted material, then you're adding to the top, and about five or six months later, you can kind of start taking stuff out of the bottom. And if you have two of those going, then you can get maybe, you know, um, a couple of gallons, three or four gallons of soil out at any given time when you're doing some potting or planting. So that's nice. Otherwise, you're doing something big, you just kind of have to wait. I like to do it over the winter because it's like, I'm not planting anything anyway, you know? Um, and it seems to work just as well, unless you have like a really crazy winter, but that wasn't last winter, was it? Um, so yeah, so that, so I'll stop there about the, um, you know, traditional compost, which is transforming um, organic and you know, inorganic components into living soil using microorganisms, heat, air, and water. That is kind of the, what we just discussed. Does anybody have any particular questions about that? Um, you didn't talk about um, periodically turning the pile, okay. or don't you? Great. So, yes. I mean, you said about turning it out, yep. but I've heard it, you know, every two weeks, Great. turn it. And, um, I think it depends on a couple of factors. I'm really glad you asked that. I'm sorry I didn't cover it, but um, one is how, how, um, much did you break up what you put into it, right? Remember how I kind of talked about cutting things, mulching leaves, doing that sort of thing? If you do that, I don't think it's really necessary to turn it a whole bunch. I think turning is kind of what I just described, is more of a method of fixing something that's broken. Now that being said, I do, turn, I do typically turn it at least once within that six to 12 months, and that would be turning it over on itself. I'm kind of putting the the good stuff kind of toward the top and the um, stuff that's on the top that really hasn't transformed because it didn't have that like density and weight and like pressure and heat like mm -hmm. oven, you know, to cook itself in. Now it's on the bottom and it gets that. But if you have problems, I would say turning it as a solution. And that is where, you know, your spinner kind of comes in handy. Like if it is a bunch of like big bulky stuff, I think it, it, could, it could break down a lot quicker by turning it. It's a big debate 
in the composting world. I'm not part of the, I'm not going to fight anyone. <laughs> I'm not part of the debate. Some people say nature doesn't turn soil. And I say, well, we're trying to do it faster. And yes, it does. Cause I have chickens and those chickens are going to turn soil all the time. And if they can get into the garden, they're going to turn it over as many times as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. Before chickens, before all of this stuff, we had the mammoth, right? We had, there are pieces of nature that we have hunted to extinction, removed, that used, the mammoth used to turn soil like crazy. That's part of what it used its big tusks for. It was like unearthing stuff. It was an ecosystem manager, you know? So that's what I say to the, the no-turn people, you know? But at the same time, thinking about those microorganisms, what it's trying to set up inside the soil to digest it, um, I think, oh, you can overdo it for sure. Is that, is that? Yeah, I've just heard people say to turn it every two weeks. Um, Personally, I wouldn't, but I'm not gonna knock anyone for doing that. Okay. Because I think, I think you are interrupting the cycle. With the big green machine, mine wasn't called that. Uh, <laughs> for anyone at like a, you sure. know, a seminar like this, they were giving them out. Sure. But I guess my biggest thing is trying to like turn it. And you said something about a corkscrew. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it it it's kind of like a a pole, and on the bottom, and these you can also get on Amazon or probably Tractor Supply or anything like that, and it's got this little. Just another little piece of wire about the same you know, diameter as the pole itself. And then at the top, it's got like a crank. Okay. So that's great for like an earth machine. Okay. Um, so if you wanna just, you know, you don't even have to do the whole thing. Even if you're opening up a couple of columns inside of it. Oh, that's right. yeah, wow. Airflow. Mm -hmm. but, but it's the same kind of, I mean, turning, that's one of the reasons we would turn okay. is, to, is to increase airflow. Another one is to like physically break things that are inside of it that are already in a state of decomposition. So, you know, I would say try. Try one way, try the other, see what the result is, you know? But see what you think. You, it's, are you layering then the green to yeah. brown? <clears throat> yes, and a note on that from a practical standpoint, okay? This is, this is literally the compost bucket um, from our house. It says compost on it. We also have a jar on our sink. The best way to build a compost pile is all at once. Like have 500 pounds of food waste and grass clippings. <laughs> that is going to be some really awesome compost. Can anyone do that? I tried. I had a compost-a-thon at the Susquehanna Waldorf School where Iris goes to school. And I had, now I got about 300 pounds of stuff, which was amazing, but it still only kind of made half a compost pile. And it was still, you know, a bucket that someone had filled over a week. So like if you know a grocery store or, you know, it's like somebody who does have a lot of food or organic waste. Um, I don't necessarily mean organic, like organically raised food, but you know, whatever. Organic is in living, you know, stuff that was living then you might be able to get a lot at once. Um, some people are, are like hardcore, they'll freeze everything they have until they're ready. They may have like giant chest freezers, freeze all their waste so that they can build it all at once. I don't think it's practical, right? We're gonna be layering stuff, like you said, one bucket at a time. I collect in this bucket um, until it's full and that makes a nice little layer but that's gonna be for our family of five at our house. It's gonna be, you know, a week until that fills up. Um, so it's kind of sitting in there. And real quick, I'll, know, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, this is basalt dust, volcanic basalt dust. And we were talking about odors. This is an interesting, I don't know why it works, but if you sprinkle this in between layers, it's great for the compost, completely eliminates odors. Another thing would be biochar or charcoal made naturally from wood. And you can do that at home and you could literally have little charcoal briquettes from your fireplace or charcoal pieces from your fireplace and grind that up. Um, great odor eliminator. And so that helps and it also is slowing down the decomposition process, 
which allows that to happen in the compost pile. Is that bucket in your kitchen? This, your it's in like the sunroom. Okay. But we have a jar in the kitchen. It does seal, but it fills up. And so I think it's kind of a matter of volume, right? Mm -hmm. It fills up fast enough that it doesn't get stinky, mm -hmm. right? And then, you just and then it goes in here in the sunroom. I might have to find another place as it gets warmer in the sunroom. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of like a mud room that we have. Um, Basalt dust. That also, and I, again, Amazon has not given me any money, but I actually ordered basalt <laughs> dust on Amazon. I tried to find a local supplier for it because I was like, man, rocks are, rock dust is hard to move, but can I get to you in just one second, unless it's for, okay, let me. I was just with yeah. the brown and green. I just wanted to know if there was yeah. a ratio or if you just kind of like a layer of green and a layer of brown and how. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, one okay. um, or something, so, okay. but. So it is. But, you know, typically you have more browns, and so it might take a little longer to, br to break down if you don't have as much of the nitrogen. Right. Um, but, you know. Because uh, someone had said to me, put your leaves in a trash bag. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. let it sit there. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. as you're putting your, your eggshells or whatever, or, you know, your coffee grounds, whatever might be smelly, then you can cover it with the browns. Yep, yep. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. A nice little layer of that. And what was your question? Oh, you said a paper, what kind of paper, newspaper or egg Oh yeah, any kind of paper. I mean, yeah, you could do, you could do that, but again, I would say so little that it should be like the exception rather than the rule. Unless, again, you're going to cut it up small, or you don't mind seeing it over and over again. Because sometimes you might be sifting your compost out to get kind of the better the better stuff. Because not all of it decomposes right away. Um, you can get a little sifter or you can get some hardware mesh and either build some boards around it or don't bother with that, whatever. Stick it over a bucket and just shovel your compost onto it. You probably see that paper again is what I'm saying, right? Um, which is fine. Throw it back in the compost. Say, try again, <laughs> you know. So, but any paper would work. Yeah. So, Alan, so then when we shred around here, mm -hmm. that would be... You could sell compost for like, you know, $20, $30 a bag after you've made it. But that's because that time went into it, you know? I have a question. Yes. On the, on the uh, composter, are they black for a reason mm. to absorb the heat and assist in that? I, I think that they are. Makes sense to me. Because like, you know, because that's smaller than the, you know, a four foot diameter, it's probably about two and a half, three feet, three foot diameter, it probably needs the help. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And is that why you say put it in the shade? Because it could get too hot in the sun? Yeah, okay. yeah. I think kind of like, it's like find that ha that happy medium for wherever, whatever kind of compost uh, pile or, or bin or pit that you have. Find the happy medium in, in, in terms of sun and rain and put it there. Yep. It's balance. It's balanced like anything. Some plants love acid. If you, uh, or acidic soil, I should say, you don't spray acid on your plants, but um, blueberries, for instance, uh, azaleas, um, things like that. So, you know, think about what you're growing and, you know, just like the balances that we talked about, about moisture and this and that, I would say, you know, acid and base as well kind of thing. <clears throat> you know, stuff like your rock dust is going to be the complete opposite end of the spectrum. So if you were able to add a lot of that, uh, wood ash would be the opposite end of the spectrum as well, which is by, should have been on one of my lists. That's a great additive. In fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know which Native American or which uh, indigenous cultures did it, but they made really black, beautiful soil by just burning stuff and really ingraining that into their gardening practices. Okay. He's not going to let me have the beer. Yeah. 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 Somebody gave us I a say. Of time that my husband wouldn't drink. So, I so you had a party, somebody yeah. left some beer you didn't yeah. like. Yeah. Um, yeah. That being said, mash too, like or like the stuff that, you know, the spent grains that you might use from beer might be another additive. These are all great ideas. And honestly, like our worries about is it going to kill our plants? Is it going to, you know, 
those things, I mean, you would really, I just put, <laughs> I'll let you know how it goes. I had a friend who's a coffee roaster and he gave me like 20 pounds of coffee beans, like roasted that had like not sold. And so now I have all these like little coffee beans in my compost. We'll see what happens. I'll let you know. I probably should have ground them all, but then I would have wanted a cup. <laughs>